join me. We're going to do something different. Um, I don't know, some of you have done Stations of the Cross before on Good Friday. Um, this is not quite the same. The traditional Stations of the Cross is like the last 20 hours of Jesus' life. And he lived 30 years. So it's missing a whole lot of archetypal information. And what I'm following is the Stations of the Cosmic Christ by Matthew Fox and Bishop Mark Andrus. And I, I have fallen in love with this book. But, um, and then the artists that create the, the pictures that you will see is M.C. Richards and Ulrich Javier Lumis, or Lemus. Not quite sure how to pronounce that last one. Um, and there, this Stations of the Cross is actually 16 instead of 12. And because it's going to encompass all of the life. And we're not, even though we're celebrating Jesus and remembering Jesus, it's more than that. It's how is the archetypal information that we receive from the Stations affecting your life now? And how can you make it affect your life even more? Okay? So we are going to walk. And when we walk the Stations of the Cross, you'll see that there is um, a labyrinth up there. And um, Dave has put a little heart that you can follow, or you can do it as a finger. It's a finger labyrinth. Um, and I left the name of the labyrinth in case those of you at home want to look it up and get it pictured in for yourself. Um, I am going to read little tidbits of this book before each station. If you want more information or if you want to study this on your own, um, you guys can email me and I'll send you the information on how to get it. And actually you can go to Unity and, and you get the book from there. Um, so, let me think if there's anything else. Um, those of you that are here, you have a labyrinth on a, on a pad, you know, that you can actually use your finger and go through, or you can just follow the heart that's up there, okay? All right. So we're going to start the first station. And I light the candle, the Christ candle, as we talk. So when we are ready to walk the labyrinth, I want you to truly be within yourself in your own sense of God. And so we'll put the candle out and relight it at the next station, okay? So the first station is, in the beginning was the word, fireball, flaring forth, big bang, and the void. The cosmic Christ was at the beginning, and it has always been with us, nurtured us, summoned us, and intended us. It has always been preparing for us. Meister Eckhart says that for us to return to our beginnings is to return to God, because God is always in the beginning. And in that sense, God is always young and always new. To meditate deeply is to return to our origin, to our source. Meister Eckhart says it is to return to our unborn self. We are capable of returning to our radical self, our unborn self, our utterly free self before any knowledge or any choices were required of us. That taste of non-self or pre-self or unborn self gives us immense energy and freshness to face life every day as a newborn cosmic Christ, a bearer of wisdom, a son or daughter of wisdom, an incarnation of Logos, of the God self. For that is who we are, the cosmic Christ being born. And so we look at the first station and we say, now deep within us, what are my beginnings? How does my being born from 13.8 billion years of cosmic history 
fill me with awe and a sense of responsibility. That's the thought you will take as you walk. O oh, Spirit, teach me anew and in the context of a new universe story what it means that all of creation, myself included, was loved from before the beginning. Teach us what it means in giving new life and meaning to our struggling species today. And now we begin walking the labyrinth for station one. Station one is solidly in our heart. As we begin station two, I am the light of the world. Night and light shape the gospel of John. If you wanted to learn more about the light love of, God, of Jesus, study the gospel of John because it provides um, the either shadowy or illumined container in which all the events of that gospel occur and within which the archetypes of the I am's are manifested. And Michael Fox says that there is many instances of the I am throughout the Bible. We don't always look at it that way though. The darkness of night is sweet and calming, welcoming. It can be it, welcoming. It can be after the busyness of a day of being in the light. Night comes as relief, a time of no thought, of rest, of needed repose. But night should never be forever. Light moves. It waxes and wanes, recedes and returns. It comes and it goes with the seasons and the weather and the time of day. And we welcome its return. We need it deep, deep down. We need the light. Light is warm. It is fire. It is needed. How am I a light unto others? The Celtic people used to say light is the mother of life. Where there is no life, light, there is no life. Light of the world, that is lots and lots of light. For the world is a vast and ever-expanding place, and light beams in every atom of the universe. And so station two, I am the light of the world. The question you take now into yourself is how am I the light of the world? Oh Spirit, teach us how to become a light to the world and to link up with other lights to enlighten our species in these trying times. And we begin walking the labyrinth for station two.
Minneapolis Station 2, and welcome Station 3. Nativity. I think you've heard this before. We are all other Christs. Christmas is usually a celebration of our birthing other Christs. In this way, we are also Mary's other Mary's. We are all meant to be mothers of God. We can celebrate our nobility and God-like origins and our diverse nation, excuse me, diverse natures. <clears throat> We remember that the animals celebrated birth in the manger, and the angels celebrated it with praise of peace. The shepherds celebrate through, though they be the lowest on the social totem pole. The wise men from the east celebrated, and they were pagans who were neither Jews nor followers of Jesus. The stars in the sky who assisted the wise men celebrated. Jesus' mother and father celebrated nativity. We celebrated Jesus and your and my birth as a Christ child, a Christ child welcomed full of grace into this holy and unrepeatable but also wounded cosmos. We all celebrate it. So our thought now is, how do I incarnate the divine and give birth to the divine in myself? O oh Spirit, lead us into a fuller recognition of the God self and cosmic Christ we behold in every creature, and especially the newborns as they begin life with so much promise and eagerness. Give us the grace to parent them wisely. And now we begin walking the labyrinth of Station 3. We welcome the birthing of our Christ on station three and are now open to station four, baptism. It was the Holy Spirit who was the agent of Jesus' reintegration as the Christ and the Messiah, an initiation which, though it was begun by John, continued in the wilderness under the tutelage of the Spirit herself. The Spirit descends on Jesus in the waters of baptism. The Spirit then drives Jesus into the wilderness where he fasts and faces his temptations. Baptism is a pro process then, a transformation that will last throughout our lives. In what ways do I undergo a new and deep rebirth and on how many occasions? How do I develop my courage to fulfill my calling? How have I been empowered? O oh Spirit, 
Grace me and others with the courage and generosity to respond fully to my calling and see my work and relationships in light of that vocation. Grant me the flexibility and creativity to also adjust that calling as the times dictate and as the needs of my culture require. Now we take this into walking the labyrinth for station four. We are baptized often throughout our lives and are encouraged to walk those changes. Let us now open ourselves up to the fifth station. Where Jesus says, I am the living bread, the bread of life. Living bread is that presence of the cosmic Christ that endures beyond any one particular expression in bodily form. When is bread living bread? Living bread is not stale or putrid. It is healthy and hearty and contributes to life, to our meals, to our bodies, to our tables, our conversations, and our shared community. Living bread assists in sustaining and celebrating life. Jesus becomes the bread of the world and the living bread to those who are hungry for such intimacy and such sustenance. We become bread for one another by standing near when someone is ill or dying or needy in any way, and in good times offering friendship and laughter, music and food. All this is celebration in action when we acknowledge that we are the living bread, the rice, the corn for one another. Station five, I am the living bread. How am I living bread for others? How am I not? How can I become living bread for and with others? Oh, Spirit, teach me to become living bread and nourishing food for others. Teach me to seek out others who are living bread for myself and so we can together be living bread for others. Teach me how my work can offer living bread for others. And we take these thoughts now into the labyrinth as we walk the labyrinth of Station 5.
through the station five, the living bread, we are called to move forward into the world to be for others. And now we welcome station six into our lives. And I'm sorry, that should say the transfiguration. I didn't catch it in time. But station six is called the transfiguration. And the transfiguration is the story where Jesus takes three of his apostles and goes up to the mountain to reveal himself. So we start with Jesus takes three of his closest followers up mountain and there he appears to them in shining glory accompanied by two of the great prophets Moses and Elijah with whom he is speaking. The disciples in turn are paralyzed with fear. When we face the archetype of the transfiguration, we are confronted with our need to distinguish between worldly power and the power of God. The power of God prevails, not by dominating those who resist it, but by binding itself to the lives in the history of humans. The triumph is by means of the acceptance of reality, not its, its avoidance or its conquest. The transfiguration. Jesus is revealed in his inner depths as a son of God, an image of God, a cosmic Christ. Have I come to grips yet with my inner self, the place where the son of God, the image of God, and cosmic Christ dwell? where Eckhart's spark that never goes out is always burning and shining in radiant form like a jewel. Am I becoming more and more adept at seeing the same inner light in others as well as myself? O oh Spirit, teach me the deep truth of my own and our own God-likeness and Christhood and what it means for my citizenship and work and all our relations. Speak in the fashion you choose to remind us that we too are the beloved and, and enjoy your favor. And now we take the transfiguration as we walk the labyrinth of station six. We are open and receptive to the transfiguration of our own Christ self and accept that transfiguration in our lives. As we begin now to open ourselves to station seven, where Jesus says, I am the vine. This also comes, a lot of the teachings for this I am the vine comes from John. So John is a really good chapter of the Bible to read. Vines spread, 
They move fast and they take over. They are forever growing and fecund. If Christ is the vine, then he extends like roots into the ground, into the dark, in search of the source where life finds its nourishment. We too, being other Christs, are fierce beings in search of our roots. Simultaneously, we are also expressing ourselves as colored leaves and branches of the vine. Jesus and Christ are the strong, enduring, and courage-granting root that nourishes and nurtures us. We who are the branches and the leaves. Vines are quite ordinary. They are found everywhere. And we too are other Christs, which means we are called to plump deep into the depths of soil and source to find our strength and endurance. <coughs> Excuse me. Station six, I am the vine. How am I a vine? Am I a strong and sturdy and determined vine like Jesus was? and that I am called to imitate. O oh, Spirit, teach me to become a vine that is strengthened by the prunings that life demands of us, and which does not wither but grows ever greener and ever stronger, and which links up with other Christs who are, all, who are doing the same. Take these words now into the labyrinth as we walk the labyrinth, Station 7. Station 7 tells us we are the vine. We are strong. And we go deep in finding our source. And now we welcome Station 8. Well, maybe. Station 8, do it to the least, and you do it to me. Matthew 25. And that 25th chapter of Matthew is very strong. And sometimes people think of it as um, being judged, and that's a negative. I suggest that you could be judged, but to look at it in a positive way, in a way that is practical and asking you, are you doing enough? Bishop Mark says, the first thing an attentive listener may notice about the great judgment in the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel is that those gathered before the ones seated on the throne are nations, not individuals. At first we breathe a sigh of relief but then we start to worry for good reasons. How will we be judged?
One of the most quoted sayings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., is about the fabric of goodness in the universe. He says, evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross. But that same Christ arose and split history into A.D. and B.C., so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. Yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. There is something in the universe which, just, which justifies William Cullen Bryant in saying, truth crushed to earth will rise again. And so in chapter 25, we may notice that it's nations that are being judged, but it's individuals that are speaking in dialogue with the great judge. The question is, are you speaking in dialogue? Do it to the least, and you do it to me. What are the implications of this teaching of the Christ in others, especially in the least, for my calling and my work in the world? What are the implications at this time in history when so much devastation is happening on the planet amidst climate change and extinctions of many creatures? What are the movements of justice and responses to injustice that I am a part of? What am I called to be and to do? O oh Spirit, open my heart and my ears to hear the cries of the poor and those denied a voice. Let me have the courage to recognize suffering for what it is and the imagination to respond to it in effective ways. Let me find allies and let us change our structures moving them toward community and sustainability and away from imbalance and injustice. Taking this into our hearts and our minds, we walk the labyrinth of Station 8. Following Station 8, we move forward to committing ourselves to bringing justice into our world, into our daily lives, wherever it is called and wherever it is needed. And moving on then to Station 9. I am the Good Shepherd. You know, a good shepherd cares about his or her sheep, those who are entrusted to their care. Perhaps the word that best summarizes the character of a good shepherd is steward. A good steward takes responsibility and is accountable for one's sheep or one's soil, for one's forests and rivers and lakes for the ocean and the air and the plants, for other four-legged creatures as well as winged and finned creatures. All of the beings we are entrusted with. 
While few are called to be actual shepherds in our time, all are called to be good stewards of the earth and all her creatures. Just as the good shepherd is held accountable by the larger community to preserve the sheep, so each of us will be held accountable by future generations for how well we steward and guard and tend the beauty and health of the creation that was bequeathed to us by our ancestors. And by how bravely we stood up to the wolves of a predatory economic system and to corporate bosses and politicians who are raping and pillaging the earth and her creatures. I am the good shepherd. I may not be a shepherd of sheep, But how am I a good shepherd and steward of the earth and her creatures? How can I link up with others to make a difference, to defend Mother Earth and be warriors on her behalf? Am I caring as deeply about the earth as a shepherd cares about his or her sheep? O Spirit, teach us the courage and trust that will allow us to stand up on behalf of those we are charged to protect, the future generations of children and grandchildren for generations to come, so that they may delight in a healthy, holy, and clean planet full of diverse plants, animals, sea creatures, and birds. We take this prayer into our heart as we walk the labyrinth of Station 9. We close station nine by remembering to be good stewards every day in small ways. And now open our hearts to station 10. I am the door, the gate, and the way. One of the artists, M.C. Richards, says, the image of the door and doorway evoked a kind of archway in which one stands. And he read, he um, created a small liturgy, and he says, oh, I touch and am touched by the smoldering core of you. The colors that surface in your flesh carry my sight into the temple beyond seeing My heart is pounding, impatient for the sacrament that changes our bodies into communion. You are my door. Through you, I am entered. The archetype of the door comes from the passage in John's Gospel where Jesus says he is not only the good shepherd, but paradoxically, the gate to the sheepfold, which is John verse 10.
door often opens up new vistas and visions and opportunities with dreams and hopes and possibilities. All these qualities are the grace of being a door to others. A door also protects. It keeps the cold out and the winds and fearsome objects and unwanted intruders. It keeps the familiar inside, keeps warmth inside. It makes intimacy possible. Yes, we are doors. We both protect and we open to new possibilities. Station 10, I am the door, the gate, and the way. How am I a door or a gate for others? Is my door open or shut? Is it welcoming or afraid? Does it house mystery and surprise, or does it protect things that carry little excitement to them? Is my door a door to adventure and the deep, or is it merely a door to make things secure and often stale? Is it balanced on its hinges? Can it swing smoothly as needed between open and shut? O oh Spirit, make me a useful door, a door that is wise enough to know when to be open and when to be closed, when to cherish solitude and when to practice hospitality. Bless me with curiosity so that I may go hunting for the truth and beauty and greatness that lies behind the Christ doors in the world. And we take our sense of door into the labyrinth as we walk the labyrinth of Station 10. We depart from Station 10 remembering that we have the opportunity to be doors for others. And we welcome Station 11. <clears throat> I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, it's from John. The cosmic Christ archetype, I am the way, the truth, and the life, leads us to think more about reproduction and gender, <clears throat> excuse me, generativity. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That's John 7, verse 8, 38. We provide a way or path for others by our example of living out our values, by walking our talk, by finding a balance in our struggle between solitude and community, action and contemplation, laughter and grief, hope and despair, being and becoming, masculine and feminine, yin and yang. Wisdom is more of a way than is knowledge or information alone. By committing to wisdom, we also embody a way that others can emulate or commit to on their own terms. Station 12. 
Station 11, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Am I a person on the way, a person hungry for truth and full of life? Am I in love with life, even when it throws pain and brokenness my way? Do I take care of myself so that life and gratitude for living comes first? O oh Spirit, teach me to be a lover of life, to put biophilia first, to be a champion for truth and a fearless hunter after it, to be a wayfarer, a pilgrim, and a traveler on life's journey. Bring people into my world who can assist me in life-loving, truth-finding, and walking a common way together. And we take this message of the heart as we walk the labyrinth of Station 11. <clears throat> We leave Station 11 knowing that we have deep within us the way, the truth, and the light. And we welcome Station 12, the crucifixion. This is probably one of the hardest stations to contemplate. And the author... Um, <clears throat> the designer of that piece, Ulrich Javier Lemos. It was difficult for him to come up with a way for the cross too. So here's some words from him as to how, why he made it the way he did. I tried to make the cross with a little movement. It's playful, it's flexible, it's soft. It's not something rigid or strict as the cross has always been portrayed in the past. When I was a kid, I received the message that the cross was very secret, very serious, heavy religion, very intimidating. My rendering is friendlier, more appealing for me. Our symbols need fresh interpretation. My icon also represents organic form and shape. Bishop Mark says, Christ didn't die because of an unalterable plan on the part of God. That's what we were taught. He says, no, we can think differently. The necessity was internal to Jesus' life path. He chose a path that put him inevitably in the focus of a brutal imperial regime's sight. At some point, he was conscious of the consequences and cost, and yet followed his path anyway. This archetype is about courage. And I know for myself growing up Catholic, I never could buy into their version of what the cross meant, and that Jesus was a victim. He knew what he was getting into. The day he made the procession on Palm Sunday, he knew what he was setting himself up for. And then 
And he decided, even though he was given chances to deny what he was teaching, he decided to stay because he knew it was the truth. And so that is the time that Jesus became a hero and had courage. Station 12, the crucifixion. The crucifixion reminds us of the universality of suffering. All beings suffer, including the Christ in Jesus and in all living things. How are we dealing with suffering in our lives? Can we face it and not run from it? Can we walk, I'm sorry, can we talk to it and ask it what it has to teach us or why it has come back? Is there a community of sorrow and of grief that we can join and learn from and move on from? Can suffering truly open our hearts to make us large again? As Joanna Macy puts it, when your heart breaks, the whole universe can flow through it. O oh Spirit, open and stretch our hearts. Let suffering deepen and widen our souls, our consciousness, the way we understand the world and one another. Teach us that we have to learn from the dark night and from suffering. Lead us into circles of people where we can teach one another what grieving means, how it can deepen and refresh us, how it can make us more beautiful beings who serve one another and try to lessen that suffering, what suffering we can. We take this prayer now and walk the labyrinth of Station 12. We leave station 12 in a bittersweet moment. We are sad that suffering needs to exist, though are empowered with the knowledge that we can overcome. And that with following the courage that Jesus showed in staying true to what he believed, we can keep that same courage in our lives. And we welcome now Station 13, the Resurrection. And I love this picture. For he is radiant. The resurrection answers an age-old fear of the human species. It is the fear of death and the issue of immortality. Jesus and Paul's teachings about resurrection meant we were all now eligible for life after death. This means that we can get on with living now because even the simplest among us need no longer fear death or take on grand projects to stave off our mortality. To believe in resurrection is to surrender our fear of death 
and the power that fear holds over us. One enters eternal life in this life instead of waiting for another. The resurrection. The resurrection is happening daily and cosmically. All beings, even stars and supernovas and galaxies, live, die, and resurrect. Am I aware of my many deaths and resurrections? Am I grateful for what I have learned from them? How can I assist others in their journeys through death into resurrection? How do I manifest a spirit of resurrection and joy which nothing, not even death itself, can threaten or diminish or wipe out? O oh Spirit, make me a being who has tasted resurrection and is grateful for it. Make me one who sees the joy in life even through the pain of suffering and loss. Make me one who truly believes in resurrection and who joins all the resurrected ones, those who have moved from death to new life. And now let us walk the labyrinth of Station 13. We now leave station 13 in joy, knowing that through our courage and through our wisdom and through our openness to learning, we move forward anew, refreshed, rejuvenated. And we welcome station 14. I am the resurrection and the life. And this station takes us back a little bit in Jesus' journey where he renews Lazarus. Where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. <coughs> Lazarus had died and his body had been put in a cave tomb so we notice that while Lazarus has disappeared from our sight, Jesus is the one who is coming into the world. The meaning of death is, in part, about being concealed, cut off from the sight of others. It is this death in life that Jesus confronts in the story of the raising of Lazarus. Martha speaks of resurrection as a future event, something that signals the end of time in the far distant future. Jesus responds with an affirmation of relationship in the present. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus did not mean that he was the only one to ever bear this cosmic message of new life. Rather, he is saying that in our one-to-one -one relationships, patterned by love, we find courage for living, for throwing off paralysis and the fear of death. And in doing so, we are therefore resurrected. Each of us can be bearers of that message for others.
am I a resurrection for others? How am I that aspect of the cosmic Christ? How might I become the resurrected Christ more fully? Am I life for others? And how so? How can I bring more of my life-giving qualities to the world? O oh, Spirit, teach me the truths of resurrection and resurrecting and the deepest truths of life itself, now and in this life. How many times have I died? And how many times have I resurrected or refused to resurrect? Grant me the courage to let go and the trust to forgive, move on, and to live life fully, even when death in any of its forms assaults me. And we take courage as we walk the labyrinth of Station 14. And we close station 14 with a commitment to live the words, I am the resurrection and the life. And we welcome station 15, the ascension. You know, they think they could make lighters a little bit easier to use. <clears throat> Station 15, the Ascension. It may strike you as odd when you meet the archetype of the ascension of Christ to learn that this rising into the cosmos is a validation of all that is created rather than a goodbye to it all. I know when I was younger, it was taught that Jesus was like saying goodbye, you know, and that he would come again, but... It was goodbye. And so these words, when I read this, I thought, oh, that's a new way of looking at it. Jesus the Christ rises into the heavens with his body and the wounds of the crucifixion. What we may understand is that by doing so, he carries creation back to its source. This is a reaffirmation of its original blessed state, or perhaps a healing and restoration of the creation. Jesus ascending into the heavens with his wounded body is a more complete story. Part of what we carry to God is our woundedness, our failures, our hesitations, and our fears. One of the single most important words in the spiritual lexicon is acceptance. Ascension. The ascension reminds us to move out, to expand, as the universe is always expanding. In other words, to grow. 
Meister Eckhart says that God is delighted to watch our, your soul expand in works of justice. Are we delighting God? Joy expands the soul. The joy, resurrection assists, the joy of resurrection assists the expansion of ascension. Learning also expands us. Am I always learning? Curiosity opens the door to expansion of mind and consciousness. How precious and holy is curiosity in my life? Am I developing my muscles of curiosity? Not about gossip and trivia, but about things that matter. Things such as the place of humans in the universe and the risk of the universe, the universe took in taking a chance on birthing our species. O oh Spirit, befriend the expansion of our souls, the joy that grows our souls, the learning that expands our consciousness, and our moving beyond rigid boxes of religion, ethnicity, nationhood, or gender to become the fulsome and expanded people we are meant to be. And we take this thought with us deeply as we walk the labyrinth of Station 15. Now we close station 15 with a new commitment to learning, to observing, and to teaching. And we welcome station 16, Pentecost. At Pentecost, Jesus the Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit to begin the constitution of a new presence on the earth begins its fulfillment. Now Christ is present in the world, not primarily as an individual, but as a community. The work of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is to make the blood of this new body flow. That is to create channels of mutual communication and nourishment between individuals who beforehand were not aware of their essential interconnection. And I'd like to read from you from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. In the days to come, it is the Lord who speaks. I will pour down out of my spirit on all humankind. Their sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young people shall see visions. Your old people shall dream dreams. I will display portents in heaven above and signs on earth below. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great day of the Lord dawns. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This verse celebrates the spirit bringing out about intergenerational wisdom and sharing. The Pentecost event promises us that the Spirit will be poured out on all humankind and that the young and old will be alive with it, birthing new ways of relating and communicating. How are we doing? Isn't our babble-like world 
currently so often divided by religion and nation and race and gender and gender preferences interfering with this promise? How can my calling and vocation bridge the divisions among humans and between humans and other species, thus bringing unity anew? O oh Spirit, make me a person endowed with a spirit that heals divisions and brings tribes together instead of keeping them apart. Endow me with a spirit that unites Father Sky and Mother Earth into a sacred marriage, one that embodies a balance of compassion and of justice, action and contemplation, becoming and being. And we take this prayer into our hearts as we walk the labyrinth of Station 16. And now we close our stations, the stations of the cosmic Christ. And I hope that you leave this afternoon knowing that though it's Good Friday and usually is very somber, that there is still hope, there is still compassion, and there is still love. And we are called to not only remember the last 20 hours of Christ's presence on earth, of Jesus' presence on earth, but that he developed that essence of the Christ and taught us how to develop that within ourselves. And that is what we take moving forward. Be at peace this weekend and enjoy your Easter. Namaste. Thank you. <laughs>